Good evening, everybody. Let's wait for uh, people to join in. All right. Uh, good morning to you, President Blight, and good morning to you, President Baxter. Thank you so much for joining in. We are missing one of the panelists right now. So we are hoping that uh, President Malloy from King's University College will also be able to join in. Let me quickly introduce uh, our panel to uh, all the attendees out here. We have President Megan Blight, president of the oldest institution in the world to charter degrees to women, Wesleyan College. We also have President Baxter joining in from Lagrange College in Georgia, the oldest college in Georgia to ever get started. And today, we will also be joined by President David Malloy, president of King's University College in Canada. And we are discussing from youth to world leaders, importance of global competencies. And President Blight, thank you so much, first of all, for uh, giving that amazing keynote address and setting the stage up for the true global competencies, which is trust, relationship, and uh, shared experiences. These are the three most important things that I heard from you. Um, let me start off by giving both of you 30 seconds to possibly either share your journey or tell us, from youth to world leaders, what is the importance of global competencies? Let's start with you, President Blight. So as as somebody who You're grew up- You're on mute, ma'am. Oh, of course. Oh, I'm not. I'm not. Can you not hear oh, me? Sorry, now I can hear you, yes. Oh, okay. Um, as somebody who grew up in a very small town and um, who, with parents who had no money, uh, I never traveled. Uh, I never thought about global competencies. I never thought about building them. Uh, and my parents were not people who um, were thought about that as well. So it wasn't until quite a bit later in my life and when I first started my career and I started traveling for work that I started to realize the limitations that I actually had. I had no idea how to cross borders with confidence and, and speak to people from different diverse perspectives. It was really learning on the ground, building the kind of plane as we were flying it, so to speak. And so it, when I was went to China for the first time and learned how to pass a business card with two hands, or when you toast, you toast your glass below the uh, person you're toasting to show respect, um, all of these types of things that you learn on the ground. And I became this sponge. And so when thinking about running an institution, particularly for women here, how do I ensure that I can inculcate those experiences in the four years instead of waiting uh, for you to graduate out and, and figure it out, navigate the world as I did uh, in real time when the stakes are really high because you're working and you're trying not to make mistakes and embarrass yourself and others. Um, so that's what we're doing here at Wesleyan. And I know LaGrange is also doing is building in opportunities to engage with diverse cultures and perspectives and experiences so that when you graduate out, you have the confidence to navigate cross-border experiences. Now, this is this is very interesting, President Light, because throughout your keynote address and right now, the focus on intercultural competencies is significantly highlighted by you. And um, we, we really need to talk about it for almost 100 educators in the room. These are heads of schools and guidance counselors. Um, I would really like to dive deep into this uh, once we go ahead. But uh, President Baxter, uh, what what according to you is global competency? And if you can just share your experience in 30 seconds, ma'am. Yeah, for me, uh, you know, very much uh, similar to Megan, uh, global competency is the knowledge, the, the skills, the behaviors, the attitudes and characteristics that we need to have to interact with each other. And I think just to live uh, in a global economy. Uh, my own personal experience is not dissimilar. Uh, you know, my my families, if we took a vacation, it was it was still within the South. I grew up in this in the southern region of the United States. I had gone to, to Washington, D.C., our capital. I had seen stuff like that, but I had not traveled uh, very much. And it was when I was in college that a faculty member said to me, I want you to go travel abroad. And then that just got the bug in me. And I think a valuable life lesson as a United States citizen was that I realized that the United States isn't the center of the world, right? Um, and that was very valuable for me as a young person. And I want our students here at LaGrange College, our students, because we have international students, but I want our, our domestic students 
to really understand the sense of that. And for me, it was the place in history. You know, going in the U.S., if you travel around and you see something from the Civil War, which is in the 1800s, we view that as culturally old. Um, right? It's silly. Uh, when you go to Japan and you see and appreciate, right, that culture and the, 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 the pathways that the monks have tended for millennia, you start to realize, right, um, where your life is in the grand scheme of the major story. And I think that helps with empathy. I think it helps with our, um, with ego, <laughs> right? And all of these things that help us within the workplace. So I, I credit that tr first travel away experience uh, to setting the path for me that leads me to, like Megan, to say to our students, there are things in our institution that we are doing because we want to instill that our students, when they graduate, can work and, in a global economy. Uh, and and those right. experiences lead to that. Right, right. Thank you, Dr. Baxter. And and and, and coming back to uh, President Blight there, President Blight, uh, there are several aspiring educators in the room right now. Uh, we are almost close to 150 educators, and and some of them possibly want to even uh, climb the ladder of leadership uh, in in the in the fraternity of education uh, over a period of time. Mm -hmm. uh, as the head of the institution. Um, as possibly one of the youngest presidents I know of uh, in the world uh, of a higher ed, higher ed institution. What are those skills that, that have really worked for you? Um, in the truest sense, uh, any particular skill that made you climb up the ladder uh, and, and, and which are these skills that you would like to highlight for all the educators? And this is a specific educators gathering. So I'm looking for some insights on that front, ma'am. Um, self-awareness, I think is number one, uh, being self-aware about, I always say, I, I know what I don't know, and I'm going to hire for experts who, who know what I do know, what I, to fill those gaps. So I think if you have some self-awareness about where your skills are and what your, what value you add, um, and then you, you acknowledge that you don't know everything I think is important. Open-mindedness, of course. Um, and let me pause here because I think we should welcome our, uh, yes, finally, our finally. Thank you so much, President Blight. Finally, we get to see, uh, ladies and gentlemen, everybody in the room, it is uh, indeed a pleasure to welcome President David Cruz Malloy, President of King's University College in Canada. Thank you so much for joining us, sir. And we understand you were on a trip to uh, South Asia uh, recently and now joining in from Canada early morning. So thank you so much. And we apologize for any technical glitch that you were facing. Um, I will come back to you, sir. Uh, we are in the middle of an answer from President Blight. President Blight, over to you. So, hi, Dave. How are you? Um, good morning, everyone. Sorry for the delay. Good to see you. Um, so I think self-awareness is, I think, one of the key factors that you absolutely need to have as you think about growing your career. Open-mindedness, attentiveness to diversity is huge. Understanding historical perspectives and global awareness. Those are all those different pieces as you navigate different groups of people and diver leading diverse teams. So if you have self-awareness about what you bring to the table, what some of your um, what your perspectives are, whether they're historical or not, or deep rooted or deep seated, and there's a willingness to learn, there's a willingness to collaborate across cultures and an intercultural capability that you see uh, that's when I think you can start to lead. Um, but it really starts with your own self-awareness, how you impact people, how you respond people, um, reflecting on your relationship with others and how they're impacted by you and understanding that you don't need to have all the answers. Uh, you don't have to be the smartest person in the room. I always say, if you're the smartest person in the room, it's time to leave and find a different room. So mm -hmm. I think that those types of things are important as you're thinking about your leadership trajectory. Before I go to President Baxter and President Malloy, um, you know, I'm reminded of when I was uh, in high school, uh, my class teacher used to always say introspect and retrospect for a better prospect. And uh, possibly she was trying to mention about self-awareness there, that uh, being self-awareness really, really helps. Um, uh, being self-aware really, really helps. Uh, so, so thank you so much, President Blight there. Uh, President Baxter, uh, over to you. I mean, any particular skill that... Uh, that you can uh, tell us uh, and to all almost uh, almost 170 educators in the room right now, uh, which made you come this far in your leadership journey? 
Um, so very similar to Megan in a number of ways, but the the one that I think stands out the most to me is curiosity. Mm -hmm. And I think a leader must remain curious to the question. Uh, I think, uh, you know, from a science, brain science perspective, staying curious keeps, in, keeps us in that frontal cortex and out of the amygdala that wants us to yell and say, why did you do that, <laughs> right, um, as leaders? Uh, and so if I can remain curious, if I can ask questions, uh, then I think that's been the most valuable trait that I've got. I'm not always successful at it. Um, I find myself, oh, I'm, I, you know, I, I'm kind of emotionally aware, right? Uh, that self-awareness that Megan talked about and go, okay, stay curious to the question. Stay curious because that's where the learning can happen organizationally. And that's where you can help. Um, I don't know that every single person is coachable, uh, but you can, you can start to coach people um, in that curiosity and, and have them find their own self-awareness in the process of maybe a bias that they had or, um, uh, you know, not holding people accountable or what, what was it that stopped something from happening the right way versus just blaming, right? If we can stay curious, I think as an administrator, that's really helpful. I think empathy is another thing. And again, I would go to my international, uh, experiences and, and <laughs> learning to learning somebody else's journey and the cultural awareness. I, I think cultural awareness, I, you know, we're talking about a lot about international. There's that type of cultural awareness, but there's also the organizational culture awareness. Uh, and I think as leaders, we're constantly evaluating what that culture is. And when something's not happening, right, you know, the, the saying that uh, culture eats strategy for breakfast. Um, and so I think that cultural awareness, what is stopping something from happening culturally um, and it might be uh, something, or I, I think it has to be something that you work toward changing into the culture that you want, but you have to do that with empathy and you have to do that, um, I think, with curiosity. Wonderful. Self-awareness, empathy, and curiosity. We have three of them right now. Before we go to uh, President Malloy, uh, it's my duty to tell everybody, we started this uh, panel discussion because of technical issues uh, five, 10 minutes late. So we will extend the panel discussion by 10 minutes. Uh, I hope all the three presidents are okay with it. If we uh, extend it by 10 minutes, because we do not want our attendees to lose any time. Uh, they really want to listen to you, especially I want to listen to you. Ladies and gentlemen, it is a privilege to have three presidents on the panel with me, three presidents representing three different kinds of liberal universities in the world, two of them from United States of America, one being the oldest degree granting institution for women in the world, represented by President Megan Blythe. One being the oldest college in Georgia, represented by President Baxter, and one being one of the finest liberal universities in Canada, King's University College, represented by President David Malloy. And now I have a question for President Malloy. President Malloy, I was asking President Blythe and President Baxter that as the head of the institution, there must be certain skill sets that have, that have carried you all the way and they are helping you deliver or perform your duties to the very best. Um, we had self-awareness, we had empathy and we have curiosity. Which one would you attribute to, uh, attribute, sir? Um, can, I, can I be difficult, typical academic and, and uh, <laughs> choose something else or add something else? Yes, please, go ahead. Um, uh, and listening or dropping in on the last two responses by my colleagues, uh, I agree wholeheartedly with what they said. Uh, I, I think what I'd like to add is um, nothing replaces hard work. Nothing replaces hard work. So I, I think I think that's a given. Um, I, two other competencies uh, that I would suggest, one would be humility. And the third would be a sense of humor. Um, I think in these in these positions that we're in and in our interactions with students and faculty and staff and colleagues, wherever we are in the world, uh, I think it's essential that we approach those conversations with a sense of humility. Um, but I think everybody needs to feel comfortable. Everyone needs everyone needs to laugh. Uh, we are social beings. And uh, and I think if we if, if we don't have a sense of humor with uh, with all the chaos that we experience, both fun chaos, I guess good good trouble and uh, and and bad chaos, bad trouble. I think we all always have to keep our our sense of humor about us. 
sense of humor, I I definitely I will take it because uh, as much time I have spent with uh, you or even President Blight or President Baxter, I've always uh, understood that one art that all three of you have is to make uh, an alien in in North America even feel comfortable. I was an alien, and every time I I have I was in in gatherings with you or uh, having a one on one meeting with you. You always made me feel comfortable, so I I would take that up, sir, and I, I I truly appreciate that. Coming back to you, President Blight, and this is very specific uh, to Wesleyan College. Um, I'm aware, and I had the privilege and honor of visiting Wesleyan uh, two months back, and we saw this beautiful uh, leadership lab uh, in downtown. And uh, so, your college has recently started this creating equal opportunities leadership institute. Can you please share the reason? Why do you need to craft a separate leadership lab? Uh, what was the purpose? What is the reason and the rationale? Where do you see uh, the, the, the requirement of such a leadership lab? Uh, developing practical skills, I, I think is important, but community connection, going back to relationships. So um, our downtown ecosystem is one that drives so much of the culture of where our our college is situated in Georgia and, and Macon. And so we didn't have a space down there. So thanks to the generosity of two foundations, a fully funded downtown space uh, was opened called the CEO Institute, uh, Creating Equal Opportunities or a Leadership Lab, which is um, augmenting some of our in-classroom programming where it's dedicated space and place for students to come for, we do 100% paid internships. Every single student has a paid internship and that's connected with community members. So we're in downtown where all local businesses are. Um, we have our entrepreneurship and intrapreneurship programming that runs out of there. So if you're interested in starting your own business um, and uh, starting an incubator, working in our incubator, or if you wanna learn how to be an entrepreneur entrepreneur with an, within an already existing business, which is entrepreneurial skills, that's developed. And then what we do is we do these um, innovation boot camps where for uh, a specific amount of time, our students come, they learn how to ideate, design thinking and innovation. They do hackathons with like local nonprofits. They become management consultants where they're then placed with different businesses to solve some of their problems. So it's this problem-based learning working with real clients, working with businesses, in internships, mentorship, this ecosystem is created right in downtown. So it's those world, real world problem solving skills, which is augmenting their in-classroom experiences. And those skills are the ones that are going to um, help develop core competencies, global citizenship, and they'll be able to use and take with them um, wherever they go. Wonderful. And real. I mean, I'll, I'll pick on that word, real world, uh issues, real world competencies. Uh, President Baxter, according to you, uh, how do global competencies truly equip a student to handle the day-to-day -day real world challenges, right? It's good to hear intercultural competencies. It's good to hear the larger than life words. I'm sorry to state that, but at the end of the day, the educators who are there in the room, these are heads of schools, guidance counselors and teachers, and almost 212 of them right now, they want to go back tomorrow and say, hey, this is why it is important and this is how you'll be able to apply it in the real world. Uh, what's your take, ma'am? How do they actually solve the real world uh, issues? Uh, well, I think, you know, uh, at its best, we're teaching open-mindedness. Uh, I think uh, an appreciation for dem democratic principles, how to work in teams across people that are very different uh, than ourselves. Uh, I I don't I do not believe you know when I look at the students that graduate from Lagrange and the types of employment that they're placed into right and from the internships that they've done while they're here with us and then where they go it doesn't matter whether they stay here in Lagrange Georgia or they go back home to wherever home is they're interacting within their fields with people that are different from them. And if they don't know how to engage with, in, with differences and cultural differences, you know, LaGrange, uh, Georgia is home to the fourth largest industrial complex uh, in, the, in the US. That complex is not made up of US companies. So our students are having internships with foreign companies. Korean companies work very different than American companies. 
-hmm. And it's important to understand those organizational differences, the differences in leadership across those. And so I think whether it be nurses or uh, teachers or business leaders or fill in the blank, right, of people who leave us into different jobs, the classrooms, the hospital bed, uh, right, the boardroom are going to have people from different backgrounds in that room. And so I think those global competencies are critical. I don't know how you are successful, how you climb any kind of ladder in the workplace if you don't have that baseline knowledge. And that's why it's important at LaGrange College. Wonderful. I mean, that's what uh, is, is critical because whenever I, I speak to uh, some of the educators at the local level, uh, the entire focus on academic uh, competency is there, but all of a sudden we move the conversation to uh, real world issues and global con competencies making a truly global citizen. They say that, uh, uh, you know, these are good soft skills to have, but they they really do not matter. And and I really wanted both President Blight and you to tell us, and, and this is what significance uh, of this panel discussion is, that we are getting to hear, ladies and gentlemen, we are getting to hear from three leaders who have used global competencies in their own personal life, and they believe truly that global competencies are not just for word's sake, namesake, they truly make a difference in the life of a human or in the truly global scenario at large. Um, coming back to uh, President Malloy. President Malloy, you have been uh, on, and, and I understand all the three presidents here, you truly believe in international collaborations. Um, and I have seen, seen all three of you traveling around the world, collaborating with high schools, collaborating with universities, uh, but so you were recently in South Asia uh, and, and you were also collaborating with various institutions. Can you please help me understand how can collaboration between two institutions around the world truly impact global competency at the classroom level? Well, for us, it's it's opening up, uh, I guess, very, very specifically, it's opening up exchanges for our students. So, for example, we just signed an MOU with the uh, Vietnamese Chamber of Commerce. And what that is allowing us to do is not only encourage um, student exchanges, but it's also encouraging internships with Vietnamese companies um, for our students to participate in and also have a relationship with organizations here in the city of London. So th these international partnerships are, are extremely important. Um, you know, to begin dialogue, to have conversations, to open up possibilities of whether it's research collaboration or uh, COIL uh, on online learning opportunities. Um, these, yeah, th th these uh, these efforts by uh, well, the three of us, and frankly, every other university to engage with international partners is um, uh, is absolutely important. Wonderful. Uh, coming back to President Blight, President Blight. Uh, there have been a lot of instances where you have gone above and beyond uh, for Indian students at large in creating competencies or giving them opportunities. I remember last year uh, you had announced this opportunity to do internship in your office and every week you were meeting uh, these bright eight women from India, uh, training them, uh, hand-holding them. Now with only 15% of women around the world occupying board positions. Uh, I'm sure there is a lot that needs to be done uh, to bring them into the mainstream by creating opportunities or building skill sets. What more initiatives are you as Wesleyan College planning to take other than establishing now, you've established this possibly world's only leadership lab, which is, uh, which is a great initiative. Are there any more initiatives that you, are, you have in the pipeline which can uh, impact the status. Yeah, so we, we our tagline is creating equal, uh, or is accelerating equality for women and since 1836. And a lot of people would ask why women's colleges need to exist still. And it's because of that statistic that you just said, only 15% of uh, corporate boards are filled with women. Um, there's more there's more presidents named, you know, Mike or Steve or John than there are female presidents uh, of, of Fortune 500 companies. And so, we need to accelerate women around leadership decision-making tables. And you do that in spaces like at Wesleyan, where we're intentional about developing those skills. We're not leaving anything up to chance. So that's why when you come into the CEO Institute, you get um, 
it's called, it's a quad mentorship model. Each student gets a peer mentor, an academic mentor, uh, an industry mentor, an alumni mentor. And this is about people who are going to stand up and vouch for you and say, I know them, provide in mentorship and internships. But aside from that, it, we're, we're leaving nothing to chance. So Robert's rules of order, we're, le we're teaching that boardroom ethics, boardroom skills in first year. So uh, my first board board experience when I graduated out from um, university and I was sitting on a, a board and, you know, didn't know how to make a motion or what to table and when we were doing this. And I think messed up a thousand times and embarrassed myself. Um, we're not going to leave that to chance. Or many of our uh, young people have come from, you know, different backgrounds and they've not been at a, a fancy dinner or fancy lunch where there's all the cutlery and you're like, which fork do I use for this and which spoon do I use? So in first year, we set those beautiful tables and we talk to them about um, what this looks like. So it's really about building confidence at a dinner table, at a boardroom table, everywhere in between. So when they graduate out and they have great references from people who have know them know their individual gifts and contributions and can articulate that so that they're not going to start at the bottom they're going to uh, begin their careers significantly higher up than some of their peers because of the attention that they received and the intentionality that we've put into growing their leadership capabilities here ladies and gentlemen uh, we are listening to three leaders of uh, three of the finest institutions i have visited beautiful Wesleyan College, Lagrange College, and King's University College. Um, and this is this is truly amazing. I, I also want to ask, and this is beyond the scope of the discussion, uh, President Blight, before we go to President Baxter and President Malloy again, uh, and, and, and specifically with you, because uh, I have had the privilege of hosting your delegation a couple of times in India uh, previously. Does it, this intercultural competency, does it even affect leaders like you who are well-traveled? Um, can you just recount any experience uh, when you were actually coming to India for the first time or visiting any particular country for the first time? Do you really spend time in, in uh, you know, analyzing, understanding? Oh. Because even today when I talk to you at times, I believe uh, I'm trying to convert my Hindi into English and it was completely different way, the way I want to communicate to you. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm speaking something and, and possibly it, it means something else. Does it happen with you? So it's funny, so many of the educators who are listening and the principals will laugh at this because I mean, some of the first times I came, one of the big things I learned in coming to India is don't eat breakfast. Do not eat breakfast ever because if you go into these schools, they are going to feed you and they're going to insist that they feed you and you cannot say no. And so, I mean, you don't go into uh, a Divi Mistra school and say when she brings you all the hospitality um, and all the, the wonderful food that is provided, you can't say, oh, I'm full. And it's like, no, you're not. Keep going. So I think I, I'm still amazed at all of the, the hospitality, the experiences um, the, and, and understanding exactly what uh, respect looks like and um, how that's translated. So I'm constantly learning. And as I'm sure some of my colleagues are, nobody is ever an expert at, you know, intercultural competency where it's it's a continuum. And, and President Malloy, did you face the same thing in South Asia this time? I, I'm sure it was it wasn't your first trip to South Asia, but uh, these these instances do they happen with you as well? Oh yeah, without without question. And when I was a student, I I was an exchange student in Japan for a year. So uh, I I think international travel, if it does nothing, it helps you be much more self aware. Uh, and if you're not becoming more self aware, then you've you've missed something. You know you're. <laughs> it's it's like it's like traveling internationally and going to mcdonald's uh right. which which you which you shouldn't do unless you're really desperate but no i i think every time i've gone to uh, a country it's you know i try to put put a pause on all of the assumptions that i'm bringing from canada and um you know just at, uh, approach every situation with beginner eyes uh and i really like that phrase beginner eyes uh, and and try to soak the culture in as much as as much as possible, and then for weeks, for months afterwards, I'm I'm thinking about um, meetings I had or people I interacted with, whether it's on the street or whether it's at a university boardroom. Um, it, international experience is 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 the best educator. Frankly, I think it's more important than anything we ever do in the classroom. Suppose I shouldn't say that, but I think I think yeah, it's true. That, and very, very subtly, you even uh, re-emphasized what President Blight said 
uh, it starts with self-awareness, right? It starts with self-awareness. Uh, and and it when you are self-aware, you also want to become aware about others, right? So, so that's very important. Uh, President Baxter, coming to you, and this is more of a serious question. Um, how easy or difficult it is to imbibe these global competencies as a part of the campus culture? Uh, you know, when when everything is intentional about it. Like, for example, when I when I hear uh, President Blight and she says leadership lab, I what I see is a great initiative which is intentional. It's just not that it's happening. It has been intentionally set up because it's intentional to develop these competencies in Wesleyan. So how do you do that? I, you have to be intentional and strategic. Uh, a number of years ago, uh, probably 15 to 17 years ago, LaGrange College had a concerted effort of bringing um, faculty at an at institution of higher education. Having your faculty on board is absolutely critical. Uh, I can have a wonderful idea, but it's not going to go anywhere if I don't have people bought in right uh, to the strategy. And so the president at that time uh, understood uh, that our students needed this globe, th these global competencies. And so there was an intentional effort to look at the curriculum, for example. Um, what are the literature sources that are being chosen? Are they all, uh, Americans love British literature. <laughs> Is that the only foreign sources of information that we're, that we're ha assigning in classes, um, in addition to American authors? as an example. Um, the types of history, right? Are we delving deeply, again, are we only focused on certain regions of the world when we talk about world history versus looking at some other areas? Um, so for LaGrange College, uh, back at that time, there was an, a, a project, they named it. it. It was, they wanted it to be a part of the culture, part of the DNA. So there were a lot of intentional conversations as a campus. There were conversations with students about why it was important. And today I, I inherit this gift of that hard work that happened before me. And so what it looks like now is, you know, for example, I'm taking a group of students to Ireland uh, on January 2nd uh, because they, we are doing a play called Dancing with Lunasa that is based in uh, the 1930s in Ireland. And we're taking the students there to live in the place. This is a semi-autobiographical play to live in that place. And the goal and the, and the framework that the college established when they said, these are the things that are important. It's not just awareness. So we asked the faculty member, when you talk about intentionality, you can't just go to Ireland, right? What is it that you want to, the students to get out of this? And we frame it in what's the awareness that's gonna be gained? What's the global perspective that's going to be gained? And then how are they engaging that culture? And you, you have to answer all of those and you have to answer them well for that trip to go, right? Um, and so it's it's this real intentional piece. It's intentional, I, I agree completely with Megan and the leadership development that we do. Um, you leave nothing to chance, right? Um, how do you build an agenda for a meeting? Um, the, you know, uh, all of these details of what, what needs to happen. But we look at our cultural enrichment program. That was another piece that they had. Uh, the speakers that we bring to campus, the opportunities for internships and externships. Again, how can we get that student out of maybe their comfort zone so that they're learning? Um, and we have assigned staff, right, asking and looking at, at this. And so it, it, it's not left to chance. Uh, and it's real. It's very organized. Our clubs and organizations. I mean, it 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 is a part of the DNA now of the college because of the hard work that happened. It didn't start that way, to be clear, right? But the hard work then got it. So if we're looking at a general education requirement, what's the global competency that's going to be gained through that that experience? That's the where the college is. So it's. It's not just about international students coming in, right? And if somebody goes, oh, well, we have international students. No, no, that's not what we mean with global competencies, right? That's a piece of it because we're getting to learn from that culture, but that's very small. And so we stop and we educate along the way. Wonderful. Now, I mean, it's one thing that I get to uh, question three of the uh, precedents of uh, some of the finest liberal universities I've and colleges I've visited. How about if I give you an opportunity, and, and this is a surprise that I'm pulling off, 
If I give you an opportunity, and 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 this time we'll start in the reverse order. President Malloy, let's start with you. And uh, uh, this would be possibly your uh, ending remarks uh, for the panel discussion. This would be possibly your suggestions to almost 250 educators in the room. Uh, this could be your success mantra uh, of being <laughs> at the helm of uh, institutions. And and I want I want 30 seconds each, heart to heart, from you, from President Baxter, from you, President Blight, 30 seconds to 45 seconds, whatever, but heart to heart to every educator in the room who is actually looking up all three, looking up to all three of you to handhold the Indian students who come with so many dreams to North American continent. Uh, and they are with you for four years in their prime age. What do you want to say, sir? Well, to all of those students, um, I, I'd like to say um, um, absolutely be be curious. I know that's been said many times today. Um, as 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 someone myself, as a student of philosophy, um, I think I think success as as a philosopher or any role in life is to be curious. Um, taking the taking the, the chance to travel internationally, whether it's to Canada or Ireland or or uh, uh, the United States, um, it takes a lot of courage. But I think if you choose carefully where you land, um, I, I and again, if you choose carefully, I think you can put your faith and trust in the people that that are here um, to really look after you. Um, I think there's a genuine um, concern. There's a genuine um, desire for international students to have a positive experience in, in our countries, at our universities. Um, so be curious, uh, be courageous, and um, have, have a little bit of faith that when you, when you come here, we're here to embrace you. Uh, and I, I'm, I'm sure I'm speaking for my, my other two president colleagues as well. Uh, we're here to embrace you and to make you have the most uh, positive international experience you can, because we do believe in these these global competencies. We we feel these are essential building blocks to develop the whole person. So um, have faith, Thank be you. courageous, and uh, be curious. Be courageous and be curious. Thank you so much, President Malloy. I have just been texted by my team that uh, people are texting them uh, at the back end to continue this for another few minutes. Now, I do not know, I've asked you to say uh, the last parting words, maybe we'll extend it. Avni, if I can request you to extend it by five minutes, I do not want attendees to feel that we are not honoring them. Uh, so you can extend it by five minutes. But uh, President Baxter, and then we'll come to President Blight and we'll have one more question each. Um, so, uh, President Baxter. Well, I, you know, I remember as a 19 year old getting on a plane headed to Great Britain for a summer away study experience. And uh, I, 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 I marvel that at 19, I had the courage to do that, <laughs> given my upbringing. Um, and uh, I am so thankful that I did. And I, I, every time we have an international student on campus, I feel a great honor that the parents selected our institution um, and a great responsibility. I'm a mother. <laughs> um, I get care and concern, not that a, a parent, a non-parent cannot, but I treat it in the same way I would as if they were my child. The experiences that I would want, um, the, the, the care. This year we had a, I'm thinking of one particular student uh, who arrived very courageously, got here and within a week was so homesick right? And surrounding that student from Argentina uh, and in communicating with parents, right? And assuring and talking and making sure. And now I saw him in the cafeteria the other day and he's having a good time, right? And uh, just that commitment that global competency is very important. And then there's this other human side that goes with it. Uh, and at LaGrange College, and I would say for all of my colleagues, right? We're institutions that pay attention and care greatly for our students and want that experience uh, to be a good one. And that's our commitment to every student that crosses our threshold. Thank you so much. President Blight, heart to heart. Uh, you've been to India multiple times. I've seen you 
hanging around on the campus, stopping by Indian students. I've had the honor of meeting uh, a bunch of Indian students uh, at your campus uh, very recently. Heart to heart to all the educators. Yeah, it, honestly, it's it's very similar to what um, President Malloy and President Baxter said. Uh, and I've had I have the actually the unique perspective of I I have been to both of their institutions and met both of their teams. And so, when I'm talking to educators who really are responsible for supporting families in their decision to uh, encourage uh, students to study abroad. Think small liberal arts schools, whether it's in the U.S. Mm -hmm. or in Canada. Um, don't worry about the name across the sweatshirt. Don't worry about the QR rankings when you're learning how to learn and you're away from your family for the first time. Um, it, it it doesn't matter. You need to come to campuses where, as uh, Dr. Baxter said, you're, you've got communities that are going to rally around you. Um, LaGrange, Kings, Wesleyan, these are small, intimate communities, right, that you can't get lost in. So if you're homesick, if you're struggling with a course, um, if something happens back home and you're trying to navigate that when you're miles and miles and miles away, you want you don't want to be a number. You don't want to be the back in the back of a 400 person lecture hall where whether you show up to class or not, nobody cares. If you're in your residence and you don't come out for activities or events or to eat meals with uh, your friends, nobody notices. At our campuses at King's and LaGrange and at Wesleyan, people are noticing, people are knocking on your doors and pulling you out and engaging you so that you can get the most out of your four years at the undergraduate experience. If you want to go on to a master's degree graduate school, go to those big research intensive mm -hmm. universities that have the big labs and all of the research dollars. Absolutely. But when you're sending your children away from home, Go to places where you get access to the presidents, where students can come in and say, I'm struggling, where you're going to create this community of care and nurturing, which I can vouch for both of these institutions because I've been there, met their teams, that they're doing exceptionally well. So that would be my my heart to heart it, as, a, as a parent, as a president. I see it. I've been to I went to two big re research intensive universities and took liberal arts there. It's not it's not a strong model. Um, so that would be my my uh, cry uh, to these families, to these educators, to these principals to say, um, don't worry about the name across the sweatshirt, the sweatshirt syndrome. Think about the fit. It's really going to be about fit and nurturing the individual gifts of each student so that they can be a person and not a number. Couldn't agree more. Uh, I, I, I so agree that you, you need to be a name, not an enrollment number. Uh, a, a student needs to get up and, and, feel confident that uh, he or she can actually uh, dial in a professor and the professor will give help or stand up or, or there is a peer uh, senior who is who's, who's ready to help. And that's the beauty about, ladies and gentlemen, that's the beauty about small. When we say small, we are talking about the size of the community. Uh, when we say small, we're talking about colleges which believe in uh, interpersonal relationships, whether it is between peer to peer or whether it is between peer to the faculty uh, or student to the faculty. Uh, it means about a sense of belongingness. That's what we are talking about. Um, 30 seconds each. I, I, I really want to uh, uh, take one more question. And this is more from uh, Indian specific context uh, that I'm asking. And you can give me a global uh, perspective to it possibly 270 odd uh, educators in the room representing thousands of students right now. And you can, uh, and this is the time where you can actually take example about your institution. And I would want you to take the example of your institution so that tomorrow when they go into the classroom, whether Monday, they should be able to say something about Wesleyan College, something about King's University College, something about Lagrange and tell them that why these institutions are building leaders for the future. Uh, the theme of our panel discussion from youth to world leaders. Uh, so let's start with you, President Malloy, and uh, we go in the same order again. Um, 30 seconds, sir. What is about Kings that these educators should go out there and talk about in their classrooms? Okay, I'll give you my uh, my 30 second elevator pitch. Um, the, 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 the two principles that Kings operates on uh, one is for every student on campus, regardless of where they're from, that they're treated with dignity and respect. The second principle is that we engage with the community. So whether you're uh, in the finance or economics or in philosophy or in English, 
Um, you're going to be engaging with the, uh, in, in, in our case, the London community. You're going to be engaging with uh, leadership in the community. And you're going to be developing skills outside the classroom that you're going to need for your career. Um, I, I like to think that if a, if a student, for example, takes an economics degree at King's, the, um, the, the theoretical background will probably be the same as a student who attends Cambridge or who attends Harvard or who attends University of New South Wales. Um, I'd like to think the difference at King's, and I would argue the difference for other liberal art, small liberal art universities is that our graduates have those basic competencies, but they also have a sense of taking those skill sets into the community and uh, really contributing to the community. So it's not just information, it's not just theory, it's about making the world a better place, kind of one person at a time. Thank you so much. Making the world a better place, one person at a time. Uh, President Baxter, 30 seconds. We are running out of time completely. Yes. I, I, you know, we can look at our mission statement as a college, uh, honoring that liberal arts um, heritage and everything we do stemming off of that. Our values here as a college are excellence, service, civility, diversity, and inclusion. And so like my colleagues in this small, beautiful campus where people have intentionally chosen to live their careers here because they believe in this model and that personal approach, that our students are involved in service, right? They are taught the skills to be civil to one another within the systems that they will live in, that they will work in. And I think that's a lost art, right? Um, and so it, we're very intentional on that that they strive for excellence and that we do too. So they're gonna be in state-of-the-art labs, right? They're gonna be in classrooms with faculty who understand the, the best way to impart this knowledge and be in a creative space, right? To engage with faculty. So that those, those students that are interested in undergraduate research because they want, they're interested just in their undergraduate career, but they also maybe aspire for graduate school. Many of our students want to go to graduate school. So we have rich undergraduate research opportunities for our students so that they have the skills when they get to graduate school. It's not the first time they've done um, high level research with a faculty member. So thank you so much, Dr. Mm -hmm. Max. I, I'll have to move on to President Blight because now I've been told that 6.15, the room will end. They, they extended uh -oh. it uh, beyond the limit. But President Blight, uh, your, uh, your take, Wesleyan College. So as you know, we're a women's only institution. So for us, if you want to find your voice and you want to lead, raise your hand, raise your voice, have confidence in the boardroom, the operating room, the classroom and everywhere in between, you come to a place that is focused on developing female leaders both inside and outside of the classroom. So for all the educators out there who are thinking about the young women in their classrooms who, you know, maybe want to lead in model UN or debate club, and they just get a bit nervous when they raise their hand and articulate themselves, send them to a place like Wesleyan where we can, we can get the best out of them by putting them in safe classrooms. They, they can practice raising their hand, raising their voice and articulating themselves and ensure that they will lead at the end of it. Thank you so much, President Blight. One thing I can definitely say, I had the privilege of visiting your campus recently. Your students are happy, ma'am. And uh, mm -hmm. that's what matters to parents like us back home. Uh, so your students are happy. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining in this for wonderful conversation between President Blight, President of Wesleyan College, President Susanna Baxter, President of LaGrange College, Georgia, and President David Cruz Molloy, President of King's University College in Canada. Thank you, all three of you, for joining in. And I look forward to see you soon in person sometime. See you around. Thanks, Abhishek. Yeah. Thank you. Great meeting. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Take care, everyone. You too.